Good afternoon, everybody. Are you enjoying SHA 2017? Oh, you made me scared a little bit. <laughs> uh, welcome to uh, PA, to off-grid, disclosing your zero days in a video game mod. Um, games, tools, hacking. I wonder do good mornings get any better? So welcome and give a warm applause to Rich Madsen and Harry Rose. H, um, well, the talk disclosing your own days in a video game mod might need, might need a little explanation because there's quite a lot pumped into that title, so let's get started with that. If <laughs> slides will move. Just hit that. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> Great. So... Disclosing our days in a video game, eh? Well, I think it's worth bearing in mind that the earliest video game was essentially a hack. The 1962 repurposing of a ballistic missile trajectory testing program at MIT to make the game Tennis for Two. I'd put money on the fact that half of you got into hacking through the video game's vector, most likely modding the games you played as a child. Playing computers have gone hand in hand since their inception. Uh, most people's first experience of code was reading type-in code magazines and realizing that the files on your Commodore or Spectrum games could be edited to change the game. Several computer hobbyist magazines were full of examples of code you could input and repurpose, often spending hours typing in and squashing bugs in BASIC, or even the occasionally uh, printed by the lazy writers assembly and machine code games. Um, so whether through shareware and the reversing of Doom so players could make uh, their own maps in the 90s, or the use of Half-Life 2 as a modding platform for com completely new games that we all know and love, like Portal being the biggest example of a game that started in the Source engine uh, and was acquired by Valve and turned into a full standalone game. So we get the... Uh, We get the bit about hacking and games, that makes sense. But what about the off-grid thing? Well, off-grid is a video game we've been developing about data privacy and hacking. It's basically a stealth game where data is your most powerful weapon. You manipula ma manipulate the AI characters by collecting their data and engineering the, um, their personalities. Um, you hack and bastardize IoT devices around their environments to trick or trap them or further escalate your network privileges. So without... But further ado, I'll, uh, I'll throw up a live demo because it seems like that's the easiest way of showing you all what the game looks and feels like. Um, fingers crossed, all goes absolutely fine. <laughs> so, so this should have some audio. Maybe not. Cool. Oh, we briefly had audio. Yes. So I'm just going to cheat and skip across uh, to a new level here. Show you a bit further into the game. This is a little animatic intro setup. Um, should be some sound here as well. But basically, this will be fully playable when the game gets to release next summer. Um, for the time being, when you see your behind the character, that's a bit that's playable. So you're delivering breakfast over to your daughter. Uh, she gives you a present because it's your birthday. Turns out it's a set of Google Glass style AR glasses, but these ones are open source because Jen's a bit of a hacker uh, and knows how to tool, tool her dad up. He's a, he's a complete technophobe though, so essentially he pulls out his phone and doesn't know how to connect anything. So she says, no, here, you press this button and the apps come up. Um, and she goes in for the hug. Happy birthday, Dad. But then smash. Please! Jen Harmon, you are under yeah. arrest. Yeah. Please do not resist. She gets taken away. And he gets told, stay back, sir. Essentially, uh, he gets given a, a national security letter that says, uh, your daughter's in processing. Um, we'll be in touch in 90 days. Don't call us, we'll call you. Um, so anyway, that's the basic setup for who you are in, in the game. So I'll skip this over. 
while he's passed out on the floor here, um, some of Jen's uh, compadres who have all been raided simultaneously, uh, they give her a phone call, uh, get, give him a phone call saying um, uh, basically everyone's been uh, bundled up and vanned like, uh, like Jen has, except for, um, except for one of them. And he's on the run. He's a hacker who's going to teach you, the dad who's a technophobe, from absolute scratch how to hack into the devices around the buildings. Um, and hopefully find information about what's going on. So, we're getting just some sound. Um, that's all right. So, here we have these little crypto chat conversations that you have. And you get taught by this hacker how to manipulate data and networks using kind of like a Wireshark AR visualization, uh, sort of a packet sniffer, uh, but for your glasses. You have an array of apps that they'll take you through how to use. Spectrum, data delete, debugging tools. You've got a light monitor set on your glasses. All these kind of little apps, and you've, you've got them down the bottom here, so you can use them to scan and save data and do all kinds of varying things. So here we'll just delete a couple of data points. Oh, that one's protected. Um, so yeah, I'll, um, I'll skip over back to the presentation and we can come back to the demo of some of the mechanics. Um, so the gameplay logic in, uh, in Off-Grid all runs uh, on Lua under the hood. Um, all the computers that you hack, uh, whether they're desktop PCs or IoT devices dotted around the buildings, uh, they're technically their own Lua virtual machines. They essentially run as mini computers in the game. They can input and output data. Um, they store data and in inventories from character and NPC interactions. And so the gameplay kind of revolves around acquiring as much, hacking as many devices as possible and acquiring as much data as you can to profile the NPCs. Um, this allows modders and hackers to create their own Lua hackable devices, hacking tools and data types, as well as levels and character personalities. This will allow anyone to model real life or cutting edge hacks uh, to, to whatever level de of detail they're interested in. Um, so next time you find a bleeding edge exploit, uh, why write a white paper when you could model it in a mod and pass it on to people to play? So a little bit on where off-grid sort of thinking came from. We always wanted to make something that, even though satirical, had a dose of realism and felt like a very near future dystopian tomorrow. Uh, a kind of imagination of if Soper had gone through and continued on with a de generous helping of dark, ironic British humor. We, uh, we actually thought back in 2013 when we started making prototypes of the game that one of the villains could be an all-powerful Theresa May-like figure dedicated to safety. Little did we know that we'd actually predict the, uh, the future of British politics. Um, consistently along the way, we've held off being too out there with the fiction in the game. And again, back in 2013, it didn't seem like a world where all of the devices in a building would be IoT and connected, would be um, something that people would feel was realistic uh, <laughs> and maybe was too futuristic. Uh, unfortunately, we've then throughout development gone on to implement implement our then more far-fetched ideas as they've unfolded in real life. Um, we've had to make the networks and surveillance tools more pervasive, having previously felt people would think our implementation was too over the top. So unfortunately for the real world, and sadly fortunate for our game design, the last three years have seen an incredible public affirmation of some, some of the Orwellian fears that most of you folks in here will have been shaking your heads at for quite some time. Um, to add to this, development of the sorts of project products that manufacturers think should be connected to the internet has been like something straight out of Terry Gilliam's Brazil. That is to say, underwhelmingly implemented technology prevalent everywhere, toasters that pour coffee on your breakfast, air conditioning vents that stop you leaving your house. In 2013, we really did think that that was going to be over the top, but then this kind of thing started happening. Um, but the real world is basically outpacing us at, 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 at the fiction we can write at quite a rate. For instance, slow cookers running Linux because hackers might want to SSH into their BBQ beef. Um, so the original notion was make a game about data privacy, and in the modern world, that means by default, cloaking or hiding, or even interacting in a way that produces no data. Um, our thoughts were hiding, covering our tracks, reducing visibility, we should make a stealth game. And then put a twist on the conventional hacking genre by putting it in a 3D world and using some poetic license uh, and setting up the data as a tangible thing, like a kind of breadcrumb trail. So understanding privacy and vulnerabilities and ultimately surveillance circumvention seemed to us to be something 
some people uh, in the wider public had a hard time grasping because it's invisible. We hope making data physical would help with that as well as make for good game mechanics. You play a character who's a technophobe, as I've said before. The player learns about this world as the character does. Off-grid is an opportunity to take those abstract concepts of data and privacy, uh, social engineering, etc., and physicalize them. Uh, and then get the player to explore on a basic level some of the infosec te techniques you can use to navigate this world safely. Experience it, experiencing something is better than telling someone about it. So to some extent, we just want to give players the opportunity to vicariously experience being totally surveilled um, and invading the privacy of others to try and realize what that would mean in their real lives. Who knows, this could be a way of engaging people to take a, a step towards trying out what can be a very intimidating set of privacy tools and technology, such as PGP or Tor or whatever else. So the basic structure of the game is you gain access to a building. You scan for data uh, to gain access, crack, or social engineer your way into different levels of the building's networks. You then use the personal data you find on those networks to manipulate the behaviors of NPCs to move them out of your way and avoid discovery, pranking and spoofing in increasingly funny ways. You then manage to exfiltrate some sensitive data on one of the machines in the building to help build an image of the case of what has happened to your daughter. And then you get to the roof and set up a mesh network node to look the information over. In this world, the idea of an open internet is a long distant memory. And of course, don't get caught. We want to set up uh, a kind of Tor Onion router-like mechanic where you, as the player, had to be careful in what way and how many times you access the networks so as to avoid being traced. The more devices you can hack around the building you are in, the more nodes you can add to a cascading proxy, extending the time you can scan in the data view for. We started with the basics of needing to essentially be able to clear your logs as you move through an environment, and so each time you connect to the network, you do leave a data point around that you need to be careful about as well. This has evolved into being able to scan an environment with, a, like I said, a sort of Shodan-style API that works like a visual packet sniffer. Uh, looking for open ports on devices and looking for packets of data that you might be able to use to manipulate people with. Um, and then you find those devices and take control of them to build up a proxy chain or to make them do something even more interesting. Essentially, finding and owning vulnerable devices extends your powers. So you have a set of tools that give you the ability to see the data um, characters in the world are leaving behind. Data is generated by characters' personalities procedurally, and these tools allow you to collect that data to profile them and man manipulate their behavior based on their interests or what kinds of things those guards would be easily distracted by. Essentially, you're socially engineering the AI. Each device you gain access to can also receive this data and be manipulated. Data can either have a a an effect by modifying a device's behavior based on what is received, um, or you can actually get it to do a callback or ping data to other machines and have various effects across a network. You can then use this to find other data containing passwords, keys, hide your own data, move your adversaries out of their usual patrol routes, um, and get to your goals. Collecting data is the name of the game for all the above reasons. On a character you need to gain access to, you should be able to collect their data and build up a con contextual map of their personality, or build a dictionary to speed up the time needed to use a brute force tool to crack a password on a machine, almost like a rain rainbow table that you collect actual physical pieces for. Um, but just collecting interesting data and sending it to an NPC can have an interesting effect too. Why is that? Well, how NPCs react to data is interesting. We've written GoApp AI, that's Goal-Oriented Action Planning. Uh, it's an impl implementation in C-sharp because we're using Unity. Uh, this essentially means you can throw new actions at the AI in real time, and they will find the best way to use them to get to their objectives. This allows us to do quite a lot of interesting things by manipulating the AI's environments and its solutions to navigating those environments. And naturally, the AI will do uh, emergent things in order to try and reroute themselves. So you hack a device, um, or let's say you hack uh, a light bulb in a room and a guard doesn't have a flashlight, he will need to either find a light switch or a flashlight to get through the room, but he plans that on the fly. Um, so I've got a little example of how these hacks start to come together. Uh, so this will be actually more difficult to play over there. There we go. So here, uh, you can't see because of the bloom, but someone's actually been looking at the SHA wiki uh, on this laptop that they've left open. Um, so we connect to the network. Um, because it's open, we can SSH into it. Um, 
At the moment, you just get this kind of uh, end cursor style backend for all of the, the SSH windows, but we're building a couple of different moddable UI setups so that you can have a desktop or uh, an industrial control system or maybe various others. So we're looking on this laptop for uh, Bluetooth devices, and we've just turned, uh, turned uh, the, the Bluetooth on and discovered that there's actually a radio in the room next door. Um, so these guards are in our way. Uh, we move around the room and then scan over here again. And we can see that there's uh, an open device that's a radio here. So we then are able to SSH into this because it's discoverable on the network. Oh, and uh, this takes a second because I pressed the wrong button. And so once we gain access into the radio, we can do various things. So at the moment, this one's quite simple. You can just change the music to the soundtrack in the background, um, set it to play, and turn on social media interaction, uh, and turn the volume up. And this creates a noise distraction. And because of this wonderful bug with the flashlights for the guards, you can actually see they're running past us on the other side of the wall. And so then we can evade them and get through to our next bit. Uh, so. There are various other interesting hacks as well. Um, so another example would be this vending machine. So these devices can be chained together. In this instance, we're just hacking directly into the vending machine. You can set up particle effects, animations, lighting effects as modders. So it's not stuff that you, you only get to see from a, a, a developer providing it to. You can do all of it. So here we're firing Coke cans, but you could set up a CCTV camera in the room that when a guard uh, walks past it, is set to recognize the MAC address of his phone, because phones all have generated IP addresses and MAC addresses in the game, and they connect to networks with handshakes. There are simulated cell phone towers. So all of the networks have uh, a sort of logic that you, you guys would naturally understand. Um, so you could take it that this, uh, this camera that you've set up needs to recognize a guard's uh, MAC address. As he walks through it, it pings a message to, instead of the fire alarms, it pings it to, uh, or, or the, the burglar alarms, it pings it to the, uh, the vending machine, and the vending machine is set to fire cans at him. And so you, you knock the guard over by chaining together different weird and spooky uh, IoT hacks. So these are all kind of far-fetched examples for the sake of a, uh, a kind of video game setting and, and playability. Oh, hang on, I'll get rid of that. Um, but basically, uh, this can be used to do all manner of more realistic or accurate uh, infosec techniques or showing to a kind of a, a non-technical audience what you're talking about when you've found a new exploit that you think is worrying. Um, to summarize, we've got examples like exfiltrating compromising personal data from a phone and sending it to printers on screens in the area near the affected character so that they're embarrassed and have to run over and try and shut down the printers. Scanning smart TVs that are listening for voice commands and have accidentally picked up the head of IT's conversations and stored the uh, admin passwords in clear text. Turning on smart light bulbs uh, on and off remotely and then turning up the thermostats in the room to 38 degrees or covering body temperatures in order to get past thermal cameras that you've now plunged into darkness. We're hoping players will find all kinds of new and interesting ways to combine these kinds of strange hacks uh, and uh, really kind of the types of stuff that can be done grows exponentially as we add more props, more ideas, as players ask for more features within the modding API. Um, so yeah, uh, all of the kind of modding stuff is done from the perspective of how we make things as devs. So we've basically built up a, a tool set that works within the Unity engine, um, which is the Unity engine, although proprietary, is free to use. Um, so uh, in terms of 3D game engines, it's about as good as you can get. Uh, the only real open source 3D engine out there is the Blender game engine. It's not really been reliably used to ship a, a kind of mainstream um, uh, kind of level title. Um, so here, here we've got um, the level kit tool set that we've put together. Um, these are all different bits and pieces that you can use for geometry to build your levels, but the, the kind of interesting stuff gets into when we kind of uh, start to put the, the Lua scripting together. One of the first modded hacks that we put together, uh, because we use these modding tools to make the entire rest of the game so that they work just as well for players, modders, and hackers as they do to make the core, core uh, content of the game. The, one of the first mods we put together was from a talk, uh, inspired by a talk I saw at Stillcon in 2016 last year. Um, 
And so to show you some of the possibilities of the modding tools, I'll talk you through the basic mod and how that was inspired. So this was inspired by seeing Scott Helm talk about um, vulnerabilities within the Nissan Leaf uh, electric car uh, app and its API. Um, he and Troy Hunt had done some really interesting research on, on how it could be exploited. In essence, they found that the JSON API for the car's remote control app um, could be manipulated with a GET request that required no auth other than the VIN number, which is a vehicle identification number. Um, the VIN number is actually legally required to be visible from the outside of the car. So as something that you'd use as, as auth, it was a pretty big fail. Um, and because it's a production line based number, it's like a serial number, if you get one of them, you can just increment them and then find all of the cars. So uh, yeah, they found some pretty, pretty scary flaws within the Nissan Leaf that took a long time to, to get them to come around to fixing. Um, and in the meantime, uh, Scott gave this talk. So the basic principles of it is um, it's by using HTTPS intercepting proxies like Fiddler or Burp Suite uh, to watch the comms going back and forth between the app and, uh, and the main servers, they were able to start mapping out the API, um, just stripping the SSL, uh, SSL and seeing what was kind of in there and what calls were being made. Uh, and they saw that in those calls, literally just by dropping out elements of the GET request, they could get the, the server to return that data to them. So if you dropped out user ID, but you had a valid VIM number, uh, it would send back the user ID. So you could get a VIM number and essentially call to ask for the owner's name. Uh, so it, it, got, it got scary quite quickly. Uh, and they got to the point where by dropping in the auth, uh, auth GET request, dropping everything except for the VIM number, they, they could gain access to the entire API. Um, basically, if you can get the VIM or you can control, uh, you can uh, guess it, you can control someone's car. The kind of things that they could return, uh, that the requests could return were the user ID of the owner, which is usually their name or their email address, uh, the geolocations of the cars live G through live GPS tracking, uh, battery status of the electric vehicle, lengths of journeys, um, and they could also control uh, by charging and discharging the battery. Uh, they could control basically the health of the battery and its status, and they could turn climate control on and off. Um, so they found that they could even void the warranty of the Nissan Leaf because uh, there's a clause that if it's been high charged, which is when it just goes to a, a high 90s percentile uh, and then goes back on charge uh, repeatedly, you'll uh, reduce the capacity of uh, that, that style of battery. They, they found that you could remotely void someone's warranty on a five grand battery. Um, so this seemed perfect for mocking up in a mod, as there's some nice physical elements with the VIN being displayed on the dash. Uh, and I'll show you a little video of that one. So here we are in a, a car park. Um, th let's say this is uh, Scott or Troy uh, having a little look around. I guess this is Troy, and this is Scott's car here. Um, so Troy spotted Scott's car. Uh, he walks over to it. Uh, and this is this is a pretty simple work in progress version of this, so you'll see that we can add to it later. Um, essentially, you try to use your SSH tool to aim at the onboard car computer, but nothing comes up. But that's fairly straightforward because there is a VIN uh, license plate in the window. Uh, you just get your data save app up and scan that to download the VIN number. And then, hey presto, we should be able to use that as well now. So now that's identified that we've got the VIN and you can get to the control system. And here we've just got an example where you can open the car doors and turn the uh, interior lights on and off. And so then we find that in the car, because we're in a, a high security harbor, one of the guards has uh, had his security card slip out his pocket. So those are the kinds of things you can build up with sort of semi-realistic, or not, not realistic at the moment, uh, but a, a kind of pass, a first pass at a realistic hack that could be built upon. So there's only three kind of uh, lure elements that you need to write to set this up in, a, in, in, the, in the game. You set up the car computer as a, as a device uh, and what it can control, and these, this is pretty much all of it. That's all the lure that you need to write for that. Um, set up the VIN plate to contain the VIN data that you scan, and set up the mission objects for the elements that you want to control uh, via the car computer, such as the car doors, lights, or alarms. This is fairly naive at the moment, but it's possible to build out as we continue to add to the game. So off-grid supports uh, devices reacting to data sent to them. So the Nissan hack being based on get requests to the API filling in missing data as long as the VIN was present, we could set up a data type that you could leave with an empty payload, 
or uh, that took the VIN number and uh, took a GET request, and you could send that piece of data to the car computer and get it to pull back with the user ID to you, and then use both of those pieces uh, of data as credentials. Um, you can basically start to build up, uh, as you'll see with when Harry goes through the technical details of it, quite interesting complexity. Uh, and although it's not simulation, you can model kind of some of the technical detail of your hack rather than it being kind of a top pass like these examples I'm showing at the moment. So the interfaces that we've um, shown uh, at the moment are just kind of n-curses, like I said, kind of back-end type uh, basic um, UIs. But we're working on a couple of different types so that you could have an industrial control system or um, a, a, a normal desktop environment. Um, you can run logic in these devices to make certain button presses reveal different information. So there's, there's quite an interesting uh, heat miser uh, thermostat vulnerability that was to do with um, uh, HTML elements of the pages um, not being properly secured. So if you, if you went to left HTM, which was this left bar down the side window and, uh, and uh, uh, pulled for that uh, in, in the URL finder, uh, you could get just the left HTM turn up with all of the elements, including the clear text passwords before you'd logged in. Um, so that's the sort of thing that you could mock up as a hack just in the, in the kind of devices window itself. Um, is that right? <laughs> so uh, on top of this, who knows what kind of things still Contalks might, uh, might inspire coming, going forward. Um, there's all kinds of terrible IoT device uh, ideas with horrifying XSS vulnerabilities requiring only an email address for login, etc. Um, so on top of that, the Internet of Shit is a great resource for um, coming up with fantastic takes on IoT hacks and traps for, uh, for, for off-grid. Take two ridiculous IoT devices off of the Internet, put them together, and you have the perfect trap for off-grid. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing whether people make attempts at things like this, like a, an IoT air freshener hooked up to a poker stop so that when a guard goes to collect some Pokemon, they get sprayed in the face. Uh, maybe combining Bluetooth hands-free gloves with some pel pelvic floral training shorts that are IoT connected so that when, uh, when the guard gets pranked by you, he gets a buzz. Um, and this one's actually done the exercise for me already in its advertising. Hacking the happiness of a foe's health-tracking Tamagotchi drinks bottle so they have to spend the majority of their shift at the water fountain keeping it alive. And actually, in fact, we already made this one. Uh, it includes doctor's appointments, and there's actually a little bit of Mirai functionality uh, down at the bottom. How did that get in there? Um, we're already seeing public systems that take control of entire rooms in real life. So here we have two flavors of the same system repurposed by rent -a kill One that tracks uh, the pest control traps in a building at the top, and then using the same system, another installed in public toilets to track and alert if people don't wash their hands. I'm fairly sure if a few wires got crossed, uh, that would make for an interesting mechanic. So essentially, new at hacking apps uh, and tools in the game can be created this, this way, uh, and, and will all run within the Lua framework. Um, we're hoping to see player-invented devices, data types, hacking tools and apps. They can all be created. Uh, and of course, levels of missions to be filled with all the above. So uh, I'll hand over to Harry to talk you through a little bit of the more technical detail on how we've implemented the Lua uh, side of the, the game and what kinds of things are in the API that you'll be able to mess around with. So I'll pass over. Hello, uh, I'm Harry. I've been a systems and tools programmer on Offgrid for just over a year now, and I'm going to give you a brief kind of technical overview of what making a mod in Offgrid actually entails. So making a mod in off-grid kind of has two main components. The first is making the mission geometry, so the world that your player is going to walk around in. The second is setting up the mission logic. So as Rich mentioned earlier, we're using Unity as our main game engine and also our level editor. We're really keen to make sure that we use the same tools that you will use, so that by the time we're shipping out modding tools to customers, it's like super mature uh, and hopefully fairly bug-free as, as things go. So Unity is what you're going to be using to make your geometry. It's also what you're going to be using to mark up important objects, or we like to call them mission objects in our modding tools. As far as geometry pieces go, we have over 850 so far, and that number is increasing. Those are pretty small objects, but we're using those to make much, much bigger ones, like we have pre-assembled rooms, buildings, stairwells, doors, door frames of every kind you could imagine. So you can really be as complex or as simple as you want. I'm not really into design, but I really like coding, so I tend to just throw some pre-assembled rooms together uh, and make my geometry that way. 
So this might work. That might work. So here's a little example of setting up a laptop as a mission object. Let's let's try it. Ah, cool. So yeah, it's really as simple as just clicking this laptop. Uh, if you've used Unity before, this might look familiar, but it's just adding what we call a component. In this case, it's a mission object. Uh, you can't quite see the text, but you have a drop down for the type of mission object. So in this case, it's hackable. We also have things like trigger volumes, uh, generic mission objects, which is kind of like moving around, uh, and interactions, which is kind of how we set up the Scott Helm scanning the VIN number. So different interactions can have scanning animations, or they can have grabbing animations, or opening door animations. And we're probably going to add more of those too. Let's get that back. So, and the second part is mission scripting. So that's all scripted in Lua. The main role of it is pretty much to set up your initial state of your mission, and also the logic that reacts to important or mission objects. And we have a load of APIs already, and that's, that's also increasing quite heavily. I wanted to give like a very tiny introduction to Lua just as a language, because uh, you might not have heard of it. It's really, really simple. It's perfect for game scripting. It's been used in thousands of games so far, so uh, hopefully modders can jump in if they've done work on previous games. We're using Moonshop because we're using a C Sharp game engine, or our, our code is C Sharp, and that allows us to do the bindings for that. I recommend it if you're interested. Uh, just a little bit of intro to like the Lua uh, syntax. It's typeless. It's got strings. It's got floats. It's got ints. It has. Uh, it doesn't really have arrays or dictionaries. It has tables, which are both and neither. So I've given you an example of using it in both ways. It's a really good language, except for the fact it's one index. We kind of like to think of mission scripting in off-grid as like a story or a film script. And in the sense that you're going, a lot of what you're doing is marking up a list of characters that are going to be in your world at this mission, the objectives that you want players to go through and to, to tell your story, as well as marking up the physical items that are going to be in players' inventories for them to use or they're going to pick up along the way, even if those are just kind of storytelling, world-building items that don't progress the story. We also have the data files, and these are things that could be dropped by guards, be in the player's inventory by default. As you can see a little bit, maybe, this is the PGP key of the player. So you're going to have a bunch of those for leaked documents that you might want the player to pick up, or uh, predefined text messages that might contain identifying information. Uh, and these are data files that are going to be thrown through our virtual network. So you also set up the networks, because uh, you want to define whether or not it's a mobile network, it's a mesh network, what the creds are on the network, what the names are. Loads and loads of things. You might have a, an office with just one network, or you might have a big harbor with each room having its own for some reason. Uh, and also, the fun bit, you're going to be setting up your hackable devices in here. Here's a very brief example of how that kind of example I showed before will map into actually being used. This static data up here was in that previous screenshot. It's Joe. Joe's our main character. Uh, so we have the characters table. Inside that, we have Joe. And Joe has a few values here, which is display name. That's going to be anything that the UI tries to use. It's Joe Harmon. Internal name is kind of like an ID you can think of it of. It's got to be unique. The character type here is player, but it could be guard or anything we add in the future. Prefabs like the, the kind of 3D uh, visual aspect of the character. Uh, it's just going to be the player. We're going to be the providing screenshots and, and a load of possible ones for that. Spawn point is something you'll set in level kit. It's, just, it's literally where the player spawns. So you have to provide the same thing for the guards or uh, any character with a physical representation. This setup mission is something that we're going to call for you, but you'll need to set up in your Lua scripts. And you're going to be adding the main character here at the top. So it's literally as simple as mission.addCharacter, and then the path to the Joe table, which in this case is mission.characters.joe. And we'll scan this data, and we'll read it in and, and do all the, the uh, interesting stuff. So setting up the network is, is pretty much the same thing. Here we've set up a mobile network called Semeopus 4G. And then we're just going to let the game know that we started the mission. So it's going to be a very, very simple mission with not much in it. but it gives you an idea of how you might use that static data in a way that's a little bit dynamic. Uh, I mentioned that we had different types of mission objects. So here's the triggers uh, mission object, an example of how you do that. So you can't really see because of the bloom, but there's a, a kind of a cube. Uh, well, that's a bit getting too close to that. Feels weird. Um, there's a, a kind of outlined cube, which is the trigger volume. It, and when the player runs into it, we just want to start an objective. We want to say, right, the player's entered the building, give them a pop-up, and maybe send them a text message to say, uh, hey there, I saw you got into the building. Here's the blueprints for that building. So it's really as simple as giving that trigger volume a name, setting it as entrance trigger, slapping a mission object uh, on it, setting it to trigger. And as soon as that's done, it's referenceable in Lua. So now you can say, right, I want to set the on trigger into callback. Uh, name is whatever's entered the trigger. And if it's the player, I want to start the objective. So really, really quickly, you can get something in Lua reacting to the physical state of the world. And uh, Rich mentioned briefly that we have this NCurses UI. This is all in Lua too. 
Uh, but not only is the device's kind of behavior in Lua, so you get updates on the game update, you can scan for things, you can have it trigger things every X amount of seconds, uh, but also the, like, the kind of visual representation of it is in Lua. So here we, we're using some Lua static data to uh, create this UI. So you can change things like the header at the top, uh, the background color, the highlight color. This is a particularly garish example of the colors being used, uh, as well as the buttons. If you set up buttons on the, uh, the highest level, then they'll appear on the left. And then the sub buttons will appear once that's clicked on the on the right. And those all have on clicks, so they can be used to trigger pretty much anything you can trigger in Lua, uh, or do any kind of logic that you want. Here's a few examples of the stuff that we're allowing you to do at the moment. And this, as I said, is increasing. Uh, you can manipulate the AI when you press a button. You could potentially demotivate them or change their path. You can trigger animations if you're uh, an aspiring animator or modeler and you've made something in Blender. You can animate that in Blender and throw it into Level Kit and get it triggered when a user hits a trigger point or presses a button in the UI. That conversation that you saw in the game demo, that's totally in Lua as well. Uh, it allows branching conversations that affect the game in any way you want using any of these systems. Uh, devices, this can be used to turn devices on and off. Doors, why not open all the doors? Why not shut all the doors? Why not change the keys that affect certain door zones? Particles, what, if you're into pyrotechnics, you could do some of that or make an explosion. Uh, you can also trigger sounds uh, to distract guards uh, if that's your wish. Uh, as well as manipulating the player's kind of UI and sending data around the network. So this is actually not even the full list. Uh, there's an insane amount you can do it at pretty much any place where there's Lua to be typed in. Uh, you can have some fun. I've thrown a hell of a lot at you. So yes, we're going to have a lot of documentation. So don't worry. Um, this is an example of some of the documentation we have for just one of the functions. Uh, we're having a really, we're going to plan on having a really extensive wiki. We also want the community to get involved in it. Uh, so if that's something that interests you, please, please do. That's kind of uh, part of the fun. We want everyone to feel like they can contribute and uh, whether that's posting a, a code snippet or, or actually editing this because the description doesn't sound quite right to you. Also, we've set up like Atom snippets for, uh, we're kind of targeting the Atom IDE, but I've also got this working on Visual Studio Code and if people want and there's a demand for it, I'll pretty much generate these for any IDE that you want to edit Lua in. So here we've just got an example of like, well, this is what it does. And if you hit more, this links you straight to the wiki page for that, that function. So uh, thanks for listening to me talk very quickly about a lot of stuff at you. I'm going to pass back to Rich. Cool. Um, well, so I suppose it's worth summarizing that although it does all sound a bit kind of overly complex put up on slides, we've actually more recently been testing out modding tools with friends. So this is our mate Spoonzy, who has no game development experience at all. Um, he does write a bit of Python here and there. Uh, so he basically came in, spent um, a sort of short kind of four or five hours with us, having a look at the tools and getting up and running. And he put several brand new hacks into the game based on his ideas for hacking things that would be interesting as mechanics. So you can see in the kind of left here, he's dropped a server cabinet into, uh, into a room. Then down below it, he's actually just searched for some shell code online um, and, uh, and pulled that up and then copy and pasted the content of it into... Um, into a file that will be generated within off-grid. And when he sends that file to the server, he's able to root the box with it. Um, he then went on and developed that a little bit further. And uh, we've got another friend who's uh, well into his cryptocurrency. So Spoonzy made a muscoin. Uh, muscoin uh, essentially can only be affected once you've rooted that box. So essentially, uh, Spoonzy set it up so that once you'd rooted the box with the exploit, you could then steal muscoin off of it. And so you could start to kind of envision the types of things that people could uh, could actually start to do and tell interesting stories about. Um, we kind of wanted the game to be like the South Park of data privacy and hacking games. So if you imagine episodes of South Park when something happened in the news that the, the creators, uh, Troy and Matt, uh, thought were, was particularly uh, hilarious, it could end up in an episode as little as a week later. And with the modding tools, I think that people will be able to have something interesting happen within our community and talk about it or share it or show their take on it within a mod um, in a day or two uh, to some detail. So on top of that, we're doing uh, a couple of modding workshops later this afternoon uh, that will take all of this that's been sort of condensed and thrown at you and, uh, and, and break it down and, and give you the opportunity to mod your own uh, hacks into the game. If you'd like to come and join us, there's one at, uh, part one is at 3.35, and then part two is at 8.15, and they're both in the PI, PI tent, uh, which is somewhere there-ish. <laughs> um, yeah, it'd be great to, to have you come down. Basically, uh, you can 
float in and out the, of them as you wish, even if it's just to try and try playing the game. Um, but if you have the time and you want to sit down through both workshops, uh, then because there's a bit of uh, downtime in getting everything set up, we'll be able to get you right the way through making a couple of your own mods. Um, the, it's worth going on the, uh, the wiki ahead of time um, and checking what bits you'll need. Um, like if you've got a laptop that can run Unity, then that's brilliant. Get Unity downloaded and go to the links uh, uh, on, on the FRAB. Um, and then any questions? Um, if you don't have any questions right now, feel free to tweet at me or at Harry um, or at the game. Um, and uh, yeah, any, any of that sound particularly interesting or particularly stupid? <laughs> so are there any questions? There's a mic in the middle. There we go. devices in an area can you use that to do a denial of service attacks um yeah you could you could set it up that way i mean essentially any device can be set to behave based on lua commands it receives so i mean harry you could take through <laughs> <laughs> improv lua coding in my head this is okay so yeah you could definitely do that if you set up the most of devices that they kind of knew about the ability to flood another device and another device knew about the ability to be flooded uh you could definitely make a a, a coffee machine that would refuse to like uh, give a guard coffee which could affect them or affect their motivation and they go and sit in a corner and cry because they're doing night shifts and uh, so yeah definitely in general are you designing the levels in such a way that there are multiple ways to solve problems yes yeah that's definitely something that i want yeah like all good stealth games like definitely. there's myriad ways that you can play through each level we're big fans of the metal gear solid uh kind of oeuvre uh and uh the idea of being able to solve uh some of the rooms with multiple uh, complex hacks uh, in order to be able to come back and play through them multiple times this is something we're aiming to do. Gentleman in the back. Hi, I was wondering if you're developing all of this in your free time or are you busy with this all day basically? We started out uh, just in our free time, that's why it, it, it sort of started in 2013 and we're still <laughs> going. Um, but actually we got funded um, by, uh, of all things, the UK government to make a game about surveillance <laughs> that is something that we get worried about by the UK government. Um, so yeah, we've, we've been fully funded for a year and a half and Harry came on to help us with really sort of making the modding tools flourish about a year ago and there's three of us. So we're a little three-person, full-time for now, studio. And we hope to manage to keep things rolling to the point that we release uh, next summer. We've got everything in place to be able to get to a full release with the three of us next summer, even if it's a bit tight. <laughs> Thank Thanks. You. So does anybody have a question for them? Um, any plans on multiplayer? Uh, unfortunately not. No. Nope. <laughs> it's the sort of thing that you should definitely plan into a game first port of Call, and we kind of decided that for the type of gameplay, uh, we couldn't quite get our heads around how to plan for that kind of thing. If you can get that working in Lua, though, <laughs> let me know. Yeah, That's yeah, amazing. Mod it for us. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be very impressed. <laughs> hey, uh, amazing talk. Really looking forward to this game. You mentioned the social engineering aspect and also the 100% staying hidden aspect. Yep. Will there be an opportunity to interact with the guards maybe disguising your physical appearance and entering into a dialogue with them to try and talk your way into buildings or past doors, or is it going to be 100% sort of setting up your traps, your sort of Home Alone style <laughs> cascading uh, coffee machine exploding traps, or will you be able to kind of talk your way around? Yeah, so I mean, like Hitman comes to mind uh, from that perspective, you know, kind of you go and rob a, like the food delivery van and put on the chef's clothing and, uh, and kind of work your way through. We haven't got plans for that kind of thing yet. It's, it's one of those... We have a huge list of interesting potential, but probably won't ever do them <laughs> backlog tasks. And that's probably somewhere at the bottom of it because of the complexity of implementation. However, there is the chance that you'd be able to, you saw the crypto chat um, window at the beginning, actually um, spoof someone else's number. And actually, I know this is something you're interested in, Jake, but basically using spoofing techniques on SMS or messaging services to pretend you're their wife and maybe have a conversation with them that does engineer them through... Make them leave the building via thinking there's an emergency or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it would be via the text and chat window, yeah. uh, but it maybe sort of caters to the kind of thing that you're talking oh, about. Oh, very nice. Thank you. Cheers. Next question. Hi. 
Hello. Uh, it's a very interesting idea, but uh, if you mentioned that it was the government that was funding your um, your uh, idea. Have you considered maybe that, uh, as for example, the military use um, um, 3D games for training their troops? Yeah. It could be used for uh, um, intelligence services to automatically map and uh, and, and um, uh, um, uh, facilities and the the the, 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 the um, the, networks within the network them. and the, you know make it able for their agents to uh, try different uh, um, uh, without getting there trying various strategies to uh, to uh, explore and uh, enter uh, those places yeah i i suppose it's like any tool uh, it's kind of an inert thing uh, that we don't really have control of as to how people would use for making mods so yeah you could end up with if security services had a, a, enough of a sense of humor <laughs> using off-grid as a way of training uh, their next-gen agents to, to infiltrate buildings. Um, it's not something we've built it for. <laughs> like, no, it's certainly it's not, not, not an intention. <laughs> yeah. um, but on, on the other hand, it could also be used for um, young hackers to uh, explore the realm of info security, InfoSec in a slightly safer environment um, yeah. rather than them just going into the big gray area of the deep dark web and pinging .gov addresses uh, and getting themselves in trouble, they get to learn maybe a little bit in a safer environment while they get their heads around what you are and aren't allowed to do. Yeah. So maybe there's a payoff there in it, it having a positive contribution as well as possibly being used. Yeah, but the, the, um, the idea that you have a script for the, the game, hmm. uh, it, ha it has specs for uh, you know automatic scanning of um, getting from Google Maps and uh, synchronizing things and writing it uh, right up so people can explore. Uh, well, yeah, I I mean, there are ways of getting 3D models from, I think, OpenStreetMap. Yeah. So if you can get those into a mesh and you want to throw them into level kit and run around, then that's something you could do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, is there another question? Oh. I was wondering if you've also thought about the maintainability of the code and the data model. Yeah. Because suppose you launch this indeed next summer and a lot of people, they start creating extra mods enthusiastically for this. It looks like it might get out of hand quite quickly, possibly, if you, if you haven't thought about that properly. Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, it, Harry it, gave it, a talk at a development conference uh, to game devs uh, and one of those uh, elements came up as a question. That you yeah, it's, it's definitely something that I, I'm thinking about, and I've come up with a few ways that we can potentially do it that aren't yet implemented, but definitely it's very, very high on my list. I don't want modders being frustrated about the fact that we put a patch out that's broken all of their mods, or I definitely don't want to uh, contact the modder and ask them to <laughs> rebuild stuff. Um, so yes, I understand that. Uh, that's definitely a concern, and it's, it's on my mind heavily. <laughs> um, so yes. It's one of those things that even kind of uh, the larger scale Mod moddable games that you see like City Skylines and Kerbal yeah. Space Program they they make mistakes in updates and patches that do break mods and usually if that happens a developer as long as um, they've got enough uh, resources make time to help then repatch and make sure that those yeah. mods survive in the, the second update. We're definitely going to do our best to support modders in that way. Yeah. yeah. Okay, is there another question? Nobody. Well, give um, both Rich and Harry a warm applause and thank you for your speech. Thank you very thank you. much.